All right, everybody, welcome back to another video. Today, we're gonna be tackling what I think is probably most people's guilty pleasure, and that is American Light Lager. Hey, if it's your first time here, I just want to say welcome to the channel. Uh, typically on the channel, I will do videos like this one, which is grain of glass, where I go all the way from the recipe stage, through the brew, through the fermentation, all the way up into the actual final tasting of the beer. So you get to see every single thing, uh, every single piece of this process and how it affects the final beer at the end of the day. I also will sprinkle uh, shorter, more informative videos throughout the mix every so often as well. So if you like that sort of thing, please hit the like button and the subscribe button as well. Also check out my channel page for more content like this. Anyway, today we're going to be tackling American Light Lager, which, uh, <laughs> well, you either love it or you hate it. But most of us, every so often, we grab a pack of Bud Light for the fridge. I know you do. American Light Lager, for what it's worth, uh, is indeed a super crushable summer beer. It absolutely dominates beach parties and backyard barbecues, and really it's not something you drink for the flavor. And if we don't drink it for the flavor, then why do we make it for ourselves? Maybe you want to make a beer for your friend who's only ever had Light Lagers their entire life. Maybe you want to make yourself a super crushable summer beer. Well, let me tell you, the reason why macro beer tastes flavorless and watery is simply because it's a profit margins thing. We as home brewers have the option to pick our ingredients. We have pretty much any ingredient at our disposal to use in beers like this, which can dramatically impact how much flavor it actually has. Because we're not concerned with profit margins, we can absolutely do that. So today I'm gonna do my best to make a flavorful, but still light and crushable American light lager. I'm also gonna show you a yeast selection in this video, which should allow you to work around not having temperature control for lagers. All right, so this is the recipe. We're gonna start with six pounds of of Pilsner malt. You can use really any Pilsner malt you want. Genus Brewing keeps talking about Heidelberg Pilsner malt, uh, and I don't have any at my local homebrew shop, so I decided to just see what the hype is all about, and I bought some online. So we're gonna do six pounds of Heidelberg Pilsner malt. Now, if you're not concerned about color as much, and uh, you want a little bit more maybe American character in there, you can also use American two-row malt um, and get similar results. On top of that, we're adding two pounds of flaked rice. Now, you can use either flaked rice or flaked corn. Basically, you want some sort of adjunct in there um, that is going to both decrease the amount of color in the beer, but also increase the specific gravity of the beer without increasing the body. This is also gonna end up drying out the beer a bit more similar to the way sugar does, uh, but it's also gonna leave a little bit of a residual flavor in there as well. Uh, flaked rice is gonna be a little zippy, flaked corn is gonna be a little corny. And I chose flaked rice simply because I'm just gonna save flaked corn for later when I do a Mexican lager. Um, and I'm not a huge fan of the corny flavor, actually, to be honest. For hops, uh, you can use pretty much any sort of German noble hop. Uh, that's usually what is used in light lagers. Uh, however, you can also use low alpha American varieties. And in this case, I'm gonna use Mount Hood. Uh, Mount Hood is a uh, Hallertau derivative. However, it is grown in the United States and it has a little bit more of an American character to it. Now, that being said, you don't want this to be any sort of hoppy beer. It's very, very easy with this type of beer to make this more bitter than it needs to be. Um, and we're not really even going for German Pilsner levels of bitter. We're only putting in 13 IBUs of these hops and that's on the high end for this style. They will have a uh, impact on the flavor of the beer. However, it should be very minimal. It's a very delicate thing. Um, my Mount Hood is all 6.1% alpha acid. I'm adding half an ounce of it at 60 minutes and a quarter ounce of it at 10 minutes. For our yeast, and this is what allows us to actually ferment this uh, at room temperature or higher, uh, we are using Lutra Quark. Lutra is a subset of the Hornindel strain. It was uh, genetically isolated by Omega Yeast Labs and sold um, as Lutra. It basically is a super clean fermenter, even at high temperatures. You could go anywhere from about 75 degrees up to about 100 degrees Fahrenheit uh, for fermentation on this yeast. 
and by all accounts it is an extremely clean fermentation even at those high temperatures uh, and does exactly the same thing that a regular lager yeast would do. Now if you don't want to go down the quite route, you can use dry yeast um, and I would recommend using Saf Lager W3470 uh, which is actually another strain that will ferment pretty well up at higher temperatures. 3470 is good and clean up to about 65 or even 70 degrees if you really want to push it. I've done it before several times it makes a pretty good lager uh, even at room temperature and of course you can also go down the regular lager route and just use traditional lager yeast and traditional lagering methods for this as well. For our water, we want to keep this pretty clean. Um, a generally, a low minerality water profile is going to benefit a delicate beer like this one, especially a pale lager like this. If you have no idea what the hell I'm talking about, I'm going to link a video up here in the corner that goes over the water chemistry basics for you. Um, it's actually not as complicated as you might think to understand. So this is our water profile. We're going to do 24 parts per million of calcium, 3 parts per million of magnesium, 22 parts per million of sodium, 36 parts per million of chloride, 49 parts per million of sulfate, and 23 parts per million of bicarbonate. And to get that water profile, I'm starting with eight gallons of distilled water. We're gonna add two grams of gypsum, one gram of epsom, one gram of sodium chloride, one gram of calcium chloride, and one gram of sodium bicarbonate or baking soda to that eight gallons of distilled water. That gets us a relatively balanced profile with a little bit of a bias towards the sulfates that's just going to enhance the dryness of this beer, which is actually pretty important to keep it drinkable and, well, crushable. For our mash, we're going to keep it low and slow at about 148 degrees Fahrenheit for about 90 minutes. That's just going to ensure that we squeeze every little last bit of specific gravity potential out of this grist um, and make a highly fermentable, highly dry wort. Uh, you can also do this as a step mash if, if you want to. Um, I would suggest a two-step mash, probably doing um, a long rest, about 45 minutes at 145 or a very low temperature. And then I'd wrap that up to about 158 for a high temperature step, uh, probably for about 30 minutes. Uh, that's the mash schedule I did for a Kolsch that turned out very, very dry, very crushable uh, as well. Anyway, our mash water is all heated up, so let's go ahead and dough in with our super tiny grade bill. Once the strike water in my claw hammer supply 120 volt system reached the required temperature, I mashed in with my grain bill, being sure to break up any clumps I had in the mash. Next I started recirculating. I let the mash sit for about 10 minutes and then I took a pH measurement and I saw, unsurprisingly, a measurement of 5.8, which was very high but predicted by a brewer's friend. So I added 6 grams of lactic acid to the mash, that brought it down to about 5.4 which was much better. In retrospect, I definitely could have corrected for this by adding acidulated malt to the grain bill, probably about three or four ounces worth, uh, but I did not do that this time. Once I reached the correct pH, I let the mash sit at 148 degrees for about 90 minutes, and then I raised up to 170 degrees for the mash out. After reaching mash out, I let it sit there for about 15 minutes, and then I pulled out the grain basket and let it drain for another 15 minutes. However, as soon as I did that, I fired up the controller to 100% power to get a jump start on the boil. I pulled a sample of wort for the pre-boil gravity reading and I recorded a measurement of 8.2 bricks or 1032, which was pleasantly only one point lower than my target pre-boil gravity. Once I reached the boil, I added my 60 minute hop addition, just half an ounce of Mount Hood, then I let the boil continue for another 50 minutes. At that point, I added my 10 minute hop addition, which was a quarter ounce of Mount Hood. I also added a Whirlflock tablet at this time, and then twice the usual amount of yeast nutrient, because quite yeast needs a lot more yeast nutrient than your typical strains uh, in order to ensure a good fermentation. Lastly, I started recirculating boiling wort through my chilling system to sanitize it. Uh, this is definitely the easiest way to do that. Once the boil ended, I took the whole setup inside where I could hook my chiller up to the sink and I began chilling. I let the work chill only down to 85 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, which did not take very long at all, and then I aerated the work by splashing it into the fermenter, then I pitched the yeast packet. I took a OG sample and I recorded an original gravity of about 9.5 bricks, which was 1037 only one point short of the targeted 1038 original gravity. So all in all, a very good brew day. Fermentation on this beer can be done in a variety of different ways, um, but by far this is probably the easiest way. Quike just needs a lot of nutrient uh, in order to be successful. It, it requires a lot more nutrient than other regular yeast, so just make sure you have that on standby. Otherwise, all you need to do to be successful here is pitch it nice and warm, probably around 80 to 90 degrees, and then just let it ferment warm. You can do this at room temperature if you live in a hot climate, 
Um, I'm going to let mine go at about 75 to 80 degrees for the entire fermentation, uh, which honestly shouldn't actually be that long. Quike also has that ability to ferment out very quickly, which is awesome. Once your fermentation is complete, let it sit for a couple days. Don't be impatient. Let it finish its cycle of cleaning things up a little bit, especially with a delicate beer like this, any sort of fermentation faults are going to find their way into the final beer and they will be noticed. So just be patient with it. You'll definitely get a faster lager by using this yeast, just don't try to rush it too much. Alternatively, if you're using W3470, you can do the exact same process, just do it at a lower temperature, probably around 65 to 70. Uh, for a good fast clean fermentation. It will work at that temperature. Trust me I've done it many times. The last way to do this is of course the classic lager route So pick yourself a yeast that likes to ferment at about 50 degrees or so or less um, and To get you that nice good solid lager fermentation. I would ferment it about 50 degrees for probably about a week um, You will smell a decent amount of sulfur notes when you're using a typical lager yeast. That is fine That is absolutely normal. It goes away over time when you're about 50 to 75 percent finished with your fermentation go ahead and raise the temperature of the fermentation up to about room temperature for a diacetyl rest that gives the yeast enough time to clean up any sort of off flavors they produce during fermentation uh, especially diacetyl in a lager yeast like that um, do that hold that temperature for about four or five days and then once you're satisfied with the way that the beer is tasting go ahead and package it is at this point now where regardless of which yeast selection you actually made um, you can do one of two things to clarify this beer. If you're going the classic route, go ahead and package and then put it in a very cold location somewhere near freezing for a couple weeks to clarify. This is known as lagering. It will drop the yeast out of the fermented beer and by the time you're finished with the uh, lagering phase, you should have a crystal clear beer. However, if you're a little bit more impatient like me, uh, you can go ahead and add some cold side findings to the beer once it's finished fermentation, like gelatin is what I typically will do, um, and that will drop the yeast out of the beer and you'll have clear beer very quickly. Uh, another way to make that a little bit faster if you're kegging is to use floating dip tubes in your keg so that you're drawing the beer off the very top of the keg. Another thing you can do here if you're using a classic lager yeast um, and you have a pressure capable fermenter like the Firmzilla All Rounder or if you're fermenting in a keg or if you happen to have a good unit tank um, is to just ferment under pressure. You can pitch your regular lager yeast and then go ahead and add about 10 psi to your fermentation and let it sit there for probably about a week because the fermentation will actually be faster due to the higher temperature. But adding that pressure reduces the uh, yeast potential to create fermentation temperature related off flavors and it actually works out pretty well. I've done it a couple times uh, and it makes a pretty clean beer as well. That's pretty much all the different ways you can make this lager so no matter what your fermentation situation is you should be good to go. Um, but anyway in my case once again, we're using Lutra Quike. We're gonna ferment that about room temperature or higher, probably 75 degrees, and uh, probably will be done in about a week or so. Once that's finished, I'm gonna go ahead and drop it bright with some gelatin in the keg, and we should have an American light lager that is ready to drink in probably about two weeks. After three days at 85 degrees, Final gravity is here in the Lutra Light Lager at about 10.05, which uh, I'm just amazed at how fast that happened. All right, so the time is here. Today is Sunday. I brewed this Light Lager literally seven days ago, last Sunday. So this was officially grain to glass in three days. It was actually really impressive. I fermented straight up 85 degrees, no change on that temperature. It was done in three days. Dropped all the way down to, I think it was like 10.05. So that was actually really awesome to see. It was still a little bit hazy going into the glass after I force carbonated, so uh, as this is meant to be a pseudo lager, we want it to be clear, so I added some gelatin findings and then let it kind of clarify over the last several days. However, it's still day seven, which is still pretty solid for a turnaround time on any beer, let alone a lager. Uh, pseudo lager if you will. So it tastes pretty good for a light lager. I'm actually a little bit impressed with uh, the way that the Lutra came out. I definitely want to talk a lot about the ingredients that I used in this beer and their impact on the final flavor. So let's go ahead and get to pouring it. All right, so it's called Lutra Light and it comes in at 4.3% ABV and 13 IBUs.
All right, so for appearances of the beer, it is a super pale, uh, like barely straw colored beer. This has got to take the record for the palest beer I think I've ever brewed. It has a nice white head with a good structure. Uh, it's mostly clear. It's not 100% clear, but that will change over time. It's like 95% clear. It's clear enough for me to be happy with it um, and to get most of the yeast flavor out of it. So that's what we really want for this. I do really like the color on this. It is really light because uh, of that rice addition and the fact that the Pilsner malt I used is so, so light. Um, yeah, it's really good looking beer, I think, overall. Now, overall, it definitely looks the part of a light lager. So we'll go in for aroma now. All right, so I'm getting a little bit of your classic Pilsner malt aroma. The uh, That would be white bread, and I'm also getting some hay in there as well. Not barnyard bread, but hay. Just kind of like a freshly cut hay field, if that makes sense. Um, also a little bit of herbal spice. Uh, a little bit of floralness from the hops as well. So that's actually pretty cool. You really have to look for it to find it. It does really smell like a... Otherwise, like a, a pale lager, but uh, otherwise, not too bad for smell. So then we'll go in for mouthfeel. <sighs> so I really like the mouthfeel on this one. It is really clean. It's very crisp. It's That being said, um, I don't think this is even close to as crisp as it would be if I had given it a deliberately longer lagering period, like a couple months. That would have made it 10 times crispier. Uh, that being said, it is still quite light bodied, very, very drinkable, and um, everything I would want out of a quick pseudo lager. There's also another really cool element to this um, that I think is coming from the rice, and that is an actual, like a I don't know, there's only one way to really describe it, and that's what other people would use to describe it as well. It's puffiness. Um, it's kind of got this weird, like, Rice Krispies puff type thing going on. That's not a... I don't know. I really don't know how to describe that. What it doesn't do is take away from the dryness and the lightness of it. What it does do is kind of fluff it up a little bit. Um, and I'm not really sure how to fully describe that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I like it, and I think it works very well in this type of beer. The other thing that um, I would like to mention about this is, too, that I actually carbonated this a little bit higher than usual, and that extra bit of carbonation gives a zip uh, to it, and it also makes it a bit more drinkable. All right, so now let's go in for flavor. <sighs> for a light lager that is sort of reminiscent of a Bud Light, and was made to have less than 5% ABV and like like something around 110 calories. This has a decent amount of flavor. Um, it's not watery. It's actually a much closer to, it feels like a Pilsner. It feels like something that's a little bit more sophisticated than a light lager. So I get a decent amount of white bread um, and a little bit of a graininess, but not nearly as much as if I had used a Weirman Pilsner. And there's just a nice complexity in there with the hops. Uh, I think it tastes very similar to Hallertau, but if I'm really trying to pick a difference between Hallertau and, and the Mount Hood that I used, I'd say the Mount Hood is probably a little bit more floral, perhaps. Um, it's not bitter. It's not Pilsner-esque. It's not sweet either. It's just dry. It's nice and drinkable. Um, an absolute summer crusher. And uh, just, you know, for, for what it's worth, this doesn't taste like water. It doesn't taste like crap. You just gotta be careful not to leave it out in the sun because it'll get light struck in like a minute or two and you'll end up with, you know, more of a, a Heineken <laughs> on your hands. Um, but, you know, it is, uh, it, otherwise it is a very good beer to enjoy outside. If I'm really looking, there is a little bit of DMS in here. Um, that's kind of a hard thing to avoid in a style like this that is so delicate and easy to, um, you know, kind of showcase any mistakes in. DMS is going to be in pretty much every single beer to some extent. Um, it's just the flavor threshold of it is much, much lower when it's in a beer like this. That being said, it's really not in this beer to a degree that it is a bad thing. Um, there's always a little bit of DMS that is allowable per style, um, and the light lagers allow a little bit more uh, than most styles do, which is good. So this fits right in the ballpark. I think it's definitely got a little bit more malt flavor than a Bud Light. A little bit more hop flavor as well, but it still retains 
what the core of a light lager is, and that is simple drinkability. It's very low ABV, very drinkable. It has enough flavor to be satisfying and to be a beer. <laughs> this is simply so easy to drink that uh, I had to just get another one. Uh, the Lutra in this did such a fantastic job of emulating a lager yeast. I was really, truly impressed. There is absolutely no ester in this. There's no phenol. There's nothing coming out of this. There is a caveat to that, though. So if you drink this beer where it's super young and it's still hazy, you will get yeast character. Um, and when I when I drank it, I got a decent amount of like a lemony kind of character from the Lutra out of it. But it even then was not actually that uh, expressive. I was actually really, really surprised by that. The other thing I think I would like to talk about would be the use of the best malt Heidelberg malt versus the typical Weyermann Pilsner that I'll use. It definitely has a bit of a different flavor. Um, it, this is a little bit breadier. Uh, the Weyermann's a lot more crackery. Uh, but what this really does do very well, um, and I believe Gina Brewing were talking about this, is a high, it's a high protein Pilsner malt. And what that means is you get this really nice fluffy head that's on the beer that also leaves some nice lacing on the edges of the glass. Long story short, what that means is by using this Pilsner malt, you're going to get a better head retention than most other Pilsner malts. You're going to get a fluffier, more good looking head basically on your beer um, in the long run. And I'm actually pretty pleasantly surprised. I do like the crackery character of the Weyermann Pils quite a bit, and I still will be using it. Yeah, I think the hype is legit for both the Lutra and the Heidelberg. It's definitely a very good combo here. This is kind of cool because, I mean, while it does kind of remind me of a college party, at the same time, it also is actually fun to drink. It is actually a good tasting beer. For potential improvements on this recipe, I can't really find anything that could have been an issue. Um, I'm not a person who brews light lagers on the regular, though, so I don't really have that much experience on which to base that. I like this beer, I think it turned out pretty well. So if you do want to actually make this a true lager and not a pseudo lager, uh, feel free to use W3470 as your yeast. It will have a pretty quick fermentation time at like 65 to 70 degrees, but I wouldn't go above 70 or it'll start to get less clean. And yes, it actually will do a clean fermentation that high. Other than that, really the only other potential improvement I can think of is just giving this a deliberate lagering period of a couple weeks to a couple months to really crisp it up and make it even more drinkable. Uh, but otherwise, for what it is right now i'm very happy anyway thanks for watching guys uh, feel free to hit that like button and subscribe if you learned something and enjoyed the content comment down below and let me know what you think about the video or the beer or uh, if you hate or love light lagers let me know i'm curious about it all i'll upload new videos roughly every couple weeks but if you want to follow me on a more regular basis i'm on instagram at the apartment brewer i also have a patreon which is linked in the description box down below the recipe for this beer is in the description box as well which is tuned towards a claw hammer supply system however it should work pretty well for most other all-in-one electric brewing events systems so hopefully that works for you if you're interested in purchasing the claw hammer supply system there's a link in the description for that as well as a lot of my other favorite home brewing gear if you want to support this channel specifically i have a merch store now and uh, that's going to also be in the description so if you want to buy a cool t-shirt like this one super comfy by the way go ahead and check out the merch store and i do appreciate it anyway thanks for watching and i'll catch you guys in the next one so until then cheers